one of the big problems of this globalization market liberal globalization has been that people seem as that as it seems in the very very many empirical studies that one of the basic problems of people is that they lost the feeling of having control over things in, in globalization and i think that's one venue that we would we need to explore how we can get people back of in that uh, in that respect and have get um, them feeling of having control over their uh, life and or, of, of uh, their, their jobs and, and so on. And I think the, the talk today is one of the venues, is one of the very important top topics um, just to, to confront and to, to, um, have to, to rise against uh, this challenge of, um, of people having lost control. Uh, and feeling that politicians have lost control. So I will hand over immediately to Tore to introduce you both and uh, very excited to hear uh, the talk uh, in the next couple of minutes, an hour. Thank you. Yes, as to uh, Thomas already mentioned, uh, the job guarantee got international uh, recognition because of its implementation into the Green New Deal proposal of the Democratic Socialists in the USA. Since then, it has been closely linked to the Democratic representatives, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders. The latter even made it one of his core policies in the Democratic primaries. Uh, politically, it's reminding of the uh, New Deal policies implemented by Franklin D. Roosevelt. And academically, it has its roots in the work of Keynes, Kaletsky, Eberlerner, and Hyman Minsky. And today, Mainly economists who are uh, working on it are associated with the research dream modern monetary theory. And we are thrilled to have uh, today, well, uh, what can be called the mother of the job guarantee, uh, Pavlina Cherneva. She's an associate professor of economics at Bard College. She's a research scholar at the Leva Economics Institute in New York. Uh, she was an advisor for Bernie Sanders and one of the driving forces behind the implementation of the job guarantee in the Green New Deal. Uh, and for our German-speaking audience, I am happy to announce that her newest book, which we will talk about today, uh, The Case for a Job Guarantee, will uh, soon be published also in a German version. Um, and then for whoever wants to read in German, not in English, uh, is, uh, is able to do that then. And I'm also thrilled to welcome Dirk Eens, uh, who's a research fellow at the Technical University in Chemnitz. He's also a renowned MMT and uh, job guarantee expert and author of the book uh, Geld und Kredit, eine europäische Perspektive, which uh, was just released uh, in its fourth edition when I'm, uh, when I'm right. Uh, and with that, um, I will shortly hand over to Pavlina, who will start with a 10 to 15 minute presentation of her book uh, on the job guarantee in light of the uh, US election. Uh, Dirk then will comment on Pavlina's input and we also shed a light on the applicability of the job guarantee in Europe and Germany. And afterwards, we will have an open uh, question and answer and discussion. Um, and whoever uh, from the audience wants to pose a question can do so via the uh, Q&A or the chat, and we will then promote you up uh, to the panel, and then you can uh, talk to us live and uh, in video. With that, Pavlina, let's go. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's uh, very uh, pleasant to be here and with a collaborator, long-term collaborator, Dirk. Um, what I'd like to do today is just give you a, a overview of um, what I attempted to do in the book by way of comparison to how we tackle um, economic problems today via the conventional economic uh, packages. Um, the book asks a very basic question, um, and that is, um, is unemployment truly uh, inevitable? We seem to have accepted it as a perennial feature of the economy. Um, in good times and robust expansions, we don't uh, pay much attention to it, but it is with us. Unemployment is ever present, even um, outside of major crises and pandemics. And uh, the, the way we deal with it is we basically redefine the problem. Instead of calling it what it is, people without work, we call it full employment or some sort of natural rate of unemployment below which an economy cannot 
um, go. And so to the extent that we deal with economic problems, with the economic problem of unemployment, we tend to emphasize relief. And so the job guarantee, as I will contrast it today, is actually reform. So we have two options before us. One is to proceed with relief. The other one is with reform. And relief takes many different forms. You know, as we, you know, the typical tech packages provide unemployment insurance, training, education for jobs that are not really there. There is a chronic perennial shortage of jobs. Um, there are also pro-growth policies. And as we have seen in the new liberal paradigm, they have been in the form of trickle down economics, financial stabilization, but they never trickle far down enough in the form of jobs for all. Now, uh, there are also policies that seem to be returning to the policy discourse that are more direct, that deal with unemployment by just providing employment to the unemployed. And these are very welcome, um, but they typically are put in place um, only in midst of crises. There are few, they're short, and they don't um, provide the guarantee of employment to all. So to that extent, the job guarantee is quite distinct because it is a permanent policy to tackle the unemployment problem at all times. Very simply, um, it is a, um, it's just a policy that uh, provides uh, employment to the unemployed in typically public service employment as a matter of um, a public responsibility. So it's a legally enforceable right to employment that is provided by the public sector via employment insurance, if you will. So um, um, it is not a, a solution to all problems that emerge in the labor market, but it is a part of a comprehensive welfare response or safety net that is missing a key ingredient. When a person needs work, um, then the policy provides uh, at a minimum a living uh, wage employment opportunity. So from the perspective of uh, macroeconomic policy, we technically have two options before us. Um, one is we either continue with the existing unemployment paradigm or we move to a employment paradigm where we attempt to generate decent employment opportunities for all. Um, they typically are created in the private sector but there is a residual responsibility for the public sector to serve, to mop up um, uh, the, re the remainder of the demand for jobs and provide public employment opportunity as a complement to the private sector. And to compare the unemployment paradigm, the existing paradigm with the employment paradigm, we can look at what, what kind of economy we live in. We know that growth doesn't deliver jobs. We know that unemployment is very costly uh, in human costs, social costs, economic costs, and financial costs, of course. We understand that um, unemployment, involuntary unemployment is also um, highly volatile. That's in the United States, it's extremely volatile, but that is typically the case uh, around the world where unemployment, mass unemployment accelerates in downturns and then it takes very long time to recover jobs. So we live in a jobless paradigm, jobless recoveries. Um, what we know from uh, meta data studies, global studies that um, unemployment increases mortality, it increases suicide rates, health, mental, physical health costs, and the costs extend not just to the unemployed, but their families as well. They are large and they are unbearable. We have essentially an unproductive paradigm. Unemployment is uh, not just, has zero productivity. I would argue it has negative productivity because of the deterioration in human capital. And we also know that the public sector is responsible to bear the costs of unemployment, uh, whether these are the health, the, the indirect costs, the health costs, the homelessness, the poverty alleviation programs, in addition to, of course, the direct costs, financial costs. So, um, so the job guarantee is, uh, is an essentially an inoculation against these social costs. It is a preventative policy that provides employment opportunities and a safety net preventing uh, poverty, people slipping uh, below poverty and 
uh, also the cost that I enumerated uh, a moment ago. But perhaps the most important feature of uh, the job guarantee is that it replaces um, the current, what we call unemployment stabilizer with a employment uh, stabilizer. And so just, I'll spend just a minute uh, to talk a little bit about it, that in the conventional paradigm, we have, as I mentioned, something called the natural rate. Um, and that is, uh, has its equivalent uh, from the perspective of monetary policy, that's the NIRU, which is a benchmark. It's a policy benchmark that is often used to justify additional stimulus or not. And so it's always some positive rate of unemployment, the NIRU. And essentially we live in a paradigm where the unemployed, like the collateral damage um, for, from macroeconomic fluctuations, but they are also used as a bulwark against inflation. That when it is perceived that inflation is looming on the horizon, stimulus is withdrawn, uh, the Fed steps on the brakes, and then um, we are aiming for some optimal level of unemployment. Apart from the economic problems with this paradigm, it is ob it obviously has moral ethical implications of, of doing business, going on business as usual. So the job guarantee as a, as a permanent policy that provides employment on demand is a policy that will serve best when it's most needed. In deep crisis and in recessions, of course, it will provide the needed employment that the private sector has no incentive to provide. But it will be also there quietly in the background in good economic times when the private sector, again, doesn't have demand for the residual you know, uh, labor force that is involuntarily unemployed. And the public sector will provide that employment opportunity and it will offer uh, training, transitioning opportunities, you know, help with transitioning to um, other better paid employment opportunities. So just to sum up, um, it is, it is a genuine alternative to how we do macroeconomic stabilizations. If we were to have a job offer for every unemployed person available and guaranteed, then the patterns of expenditures in the entire economy are stabilized much better than if there is looming unemployment and uncertainty about the jobs prospects. So we stabilize our macroeconomic cycles much better. Number two, the program expands in recessions and shrinks in expansions. So it actually is a, it's a, it's a uh, counterpart to Nairu. It is uh, offering full employment and uh, has price stabilization features. It is, I emphasize in the book, it is, it is a preventative policy. We don't tend to think of fiscal policy as preventative. We always react to crises. We always react to mass unemployment, but it is a permanent infrastructure that uh, will provide um, employment security uh, at all times. It is a transitional policy. It's a stepping stone for people who don't um, are just entering the labor market, those uh, with greatest obstacles to employment, um, those who have been out of work for a very long time. So it's a stepping stone. It helps with transitioning to uh, better paid employment opportunities. And finally, because it is a option, public option at a base pay, it in fact serves as the macroeconomic floor. It is the minimum wage benefit package um, that uh, will be secured for all. Um, of course, it works very well with minimum wage policies, but in the absence of a option, employment option, minimum wages, minimum wage policies go, go only so far. Um, they obviously don't cover those who cannot secure a minimum wage uh, job. And finally, um, it's green. Uh, the policy is green. And in the book, I redefine a little bit what green means. Um, and that is not just remediating the environment, but also addressing the human costs and all of the neglect that comes with unemployment and with, um, with poverty. In other words, um, what good would be a green future uh, if we still have people without uh, uh, the ability to access um, the green, green technology, the weatherized homes, uh, the new transportation, they still experience economic insecurity. And so the job guarantee is one way of guaranteeing that economic insecurity, um, uh, guaranteeing economic security um, by uh, putting meaningful investments in the public sector, 
by supporting people who wish to work, by serving the public good and creating something of public value and use. And that um, uh, uh, is um, uh, how the, the job guarantee uh, would be how the job guarantee will be implemented. That's a, a, a question of the kind of work that we would do. And historically, um, from the New Deal experience that Thor mentioned to the current proposal, the job guarantee has um, been a policy that remediates the environment, um, helps communities with their care needs and community needs. So we can talk a lot more about um, the way to go about implementing it, but the big picture is that it is a paradigm shift. It is one that basically says we have the means to provide uh, for the unemployed. Uh, we already are paying the, uh, the large costs. We can do it better um, by providing better economic stabilization. Okay, I will end here and- uh, Thank you so much. And I think I just directly hand over to uh, Dirk. Um, it's your floor. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you also, Pavlina, for, for taking us uh, taking us to this point where you have already discussed the, the macroeconomic effects. So what the, the big paradigm change will be in terms of macroeconomics is that we usually basically say that the central bank has to set the interest rate and then somehow private investment will adjust in a way that we'll, we will get somehow full employment and economic growth and all these things. But of course, we, we have had zero interest rates in the Eurozone for, for many years by now. And it's, it's kind of unlikely that monetary policy will work in the way it was supposed to work, at least in the last couple of decades. So what we, are, what we need basically is a new paradigm. And the question is basically, how much fiscal spending do we need to get to full employment? And of course, you could just basically do the old good uh, Keynesian kind of fiscal policy, just increase government spending. But it's not sure that you will hit full employment directly. So you have to you have to work and, and find out what kind of spending you need. So the job guarantee is also a stabilization fact in the sense that that it, it helps you in terms of economic policy making uh, to have rules, a rules based uh, uh, approach. To, to economic policy that will lead you to full employment. So that is also something which, which I would like to stress because it matters quite a lot in the European context. Uh, the, the US had interest rates which went back up to 2%, but in the, in the Eurozone, it was flat at zero for, for many years by now. So the question then of course is, where, how do you implement that in the Eurozone? Um, that's very easy for the US because you have the federal government and, and it's obvious that, that they can basically create money together with the Fed but it's complicated in the Eurozone, okay? So the way that the German government is paying its bills is basically to ask the Bundesbank, so the German central bank, to, to make bank transfers to credit the accounts of banks um, and, and pay their bills. But the Bundesbank is only allowed to do that if the government's account with the Bundesbank is, is loaded, is, is filled up with, with basically the amount of money that they want to spend. So you have to imagine this more like a political rule, like, like a traffic light, okay? So the Bundesbank can spend for the German government if the German government has the money on its account, which they can basically acquire via taxes, but also by selling government bonds. So of course you could have in the Eurozone a job guarantee on the local level or on the national level if you want, okay? So we could introduce it in, in Germany and basically say, well, our deficit will be a little bit higher but since usually we're having surpluses, it probably would, would not be a problem. Um, one example of this is uh, Spain. Uh, Spain has introduced um, a minimum income uh, a couple of months ago. So uh, in the Eurozone, it is possible to have social policy introduced on the national level. Um, there's, there's nothing that you need from the other European nations in terms of, of okaying your new policy. You just spend, okay? You just spend the way that you usually spend by having your central bank credit the accounts of the banks that receive the money, and those banks then credit the accounts of those people who are in the end getting those those bank deposits from the government. So what you can do, of course, in the eurozone is you can also think about a solution on the European level. Why should you do that? Well, because we have the stability and growth pact. We have these deficit limits. They are all off, by the way, uh, right now because the general escape clause has been activated. Um, but normally there's some kind of default risk with government debt, which is not a nice thing to have. And the European Central Bank has solved this problem with the pandemic emergency purchase program for the moment. So not sure whether this can be taken back, whether this can be rolled back. So 
if if you want, however, if you want to have this at the European level, then of course you you need to make sure who's who's going to pay for that. And we have seen tremendous changes in the last couple of months. The European Union is now basically creating debt. Uh, the debt was the bonds that they were issued were oversubscribed by by many many times. So it, it was was very attractive for investors apparently to get that risk free asset from the European uh, Union. So if, if you want, you could do it on the European level. So you, you can think about the Euro Treasury, for example, issuing Euro bonds. Uh, if you don't like the words, you can just continue with the European Commission to basically increase the amount of debt. Of course, you first call it as basically an emergency kind of debt issuance, like uh, the next generation EU thing is, is basically presented to, to basically to everybody. Um, but of course, you can basically translate that then into a permanent policy, um, which is stabilizing then the whole Eurozone. So the whole Eurozone, of course, has, has had its problems. Uh, countries like Greece, Spain are still, and also Italy are still suffering in terms of, of GDP. I think Spain and uh, Spain is above or was above uh, GDP from 2007 shortly, um, but Greece and Italy surely are not. Uh, you have very large youth unemployment in both these countries. Italians are getting fed up with the European Union. The new newest numbers are showing this. So what they want, of course, is to have some kind of stabilizing policy uh, that takes care of the fact that unemployment is distributed very unevenly in the in the eurozone crisis. So the job guarantee would stabilize the eurozone in terms of politics, I would argue, if you would create it uh, uh, at the European level. Um, if you would like to create it at the national level, then of course you can do it right now, because again the, the ECB is supporting all the national governments by basically buying lots of government bonds. I just saw the numbers for Italy yesterday. I think it was on a newspaper article, I suppose Saturday. Um, and it said that basically the ECB bought over the next, last couple of months, 62 billion euros worth of Italian government bonds and the Italian government only issued 59 billion. Okay, so basically the ECB is now buying more government bonds from Italy than Italy is issuing, which means that basically it's a risk-free asset. Um, but this, will be rolled back probably, or might be rolled back after the crisis. So it's a political issue. So what do you want? Do you want more European integration? Well, then you can aim for, for more debt issuance and a job guarantee from Brussels with basically a Euro treasury in the hind, in the back somewhere in the future. Or you basically say, I want to have local responsibility. So I put it on a national government level so that the national governments are supposed to pay for that. Um, and there was a, a paper recently published by Yannick Landwehr, who did some calculations, and he said Germany can, can afford it. Okay, so Germany could afford uh, this kind of job guarantee, uh, even if Germany is in the Eurozone and the Stability and Growth Pact is, is back on, uh, there should be enough uh, fiscal space uh, for, for Germany to do that. So these are the options for Europe that, that the job guarantee brings with it, because we have to talk about who's going to pay for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and the floor is open to everyone to uh, ask questions. Uh, I already have one, which is uh, going directly to Dirk on the on the last point you made uh, with the paper um, of Yannick Landwehr making estimations on um, how much fiscal spending uh, such a program would cost. And I would direct that question also to Pav Pavlina. What are the estimations of a job guarantee program? What are the uh, estimations of the cost? Because we, we reduce uh, the unemployment uh, cost of the government, um, but uh, surely um, there are uh, some, uh, some costs that go uh, on top. Um, we have to organize it. We have to pay the, uh, the workers who organize it. Uh, then we have to uh, pay a higher minimum wage probably as implemented right now. Um, I don't know who wants to start from uh, the two of you, maybe Dirk or? Yeah, well, I can start. Um, well, it, it's it's all in Yannick's paper, the calculations. Um, but but he says that the amount of, of money that is needed is is basically it's possible to get that and still be within the, the limits. So the, the uncertainty surrounding these calculations is, of course, that nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. OK, so um, if if European, uh, the European economy is not basically coming back, especially because of, of lack of tourism in the southern countries, then of course German exports will not be sold as before the crisis. So if, if this of course leads to a, a lower level of economic activity in Germany and then lower tax income, then of course you would expect higher deficits and then of course the whole calculation might be moved. 
Okay, so so basically what what I agree with in terms of of um, of, of basically this MMT approach with with Pavlina is that you you have to have a sovereign sovereign currency. You have to you have to have access to money uh, to pay for that, and it it cannot it cannot be it cannot be linked to deficits because if you have a crisis and then you have deficits and then you cannot pay for the job guarantee. Well, then it's of no use. So this is basically a, a policy to stabilize the economy, and of course we need this this downward part most. Um, so again, the the details are on the paper by Yannick Landwehr, which is published with the IPE in Berlin. Um, I could look it up, but you, I'm sure you find it on the web as well. Okay, so. Usually some sort of a budget number is always on people's minds when they talk about, you know, how we're going to do this and how we're going to pay for it. Um, I like to shift perspective a little bit and I'll give you budget numbers, but the way I think about it is that um, first we have to distinguish between two types of costs, real and financial. And the real costs are very large, you know, to leave, as Dirk was saying, a generation of young people without work for decades. There's an enormous social cost to this proposition. Um, we also know there are you know, specific impacts, negative impacts on health um, and um, on productivity, negative productivity from mass unemployment. So I do like to think of unemployment as a public health concern. I describe its dynamic as really as an epidemic. And this, I wrote this before the actual onset of the current pandemic. And so um, I think when we think about, you know, dedicating resources to deal with unemployment, the real costs need to be the, uh, the first ones that we need to consider. And then we realize that the job guarantee reduces costs. Then the issue is of financing, of funding. And here we do have to deal with this policy space um, that we have available. And as you pointed out, countries like the United States or have sovereign currencies have a lot more uh, policy space. So um, our budget estimates are um, uh, about 1.5%, actually less than, less than 1.5% for a very generous uh, program that provides living incomes uh, in the United States. And it has positive multipliers. It, ha it increases private sector employment um, and growth. Um, so we have, you know, macroeconomically, it is a far more robust job-led bottom-up macroeconomic stabilization as the sort of thing that we need. You know, we now spend resources to spend, stabilize the economy. We don't get the jobs, the requisite jobs, and we don't actually stabilize the economy better. With the job guarantee, with, we do it backwards. We have, we create the jobs and we push a job-led um, recovery. So, um, in terms of the costs, uh, it's also difficult to put a particular number on the program because it is designed to be anti-cyclical. So while we estimate in the US a program of 15 million jobs, that will be about 1.3% of GDP, we actually, and this is with colleagues at the Leave Economics Institute, we actually don't account for all of the savings. Um, there will be, again, as I said, health, uh, medical costs, cost of incarceration, costs of fighting homelessness that are not incorporated in the model. So you could come up with a budget neutral uh, number. Is that is that going to matter when you're faced with a pandemic and when we have millions out of work and our priority number one is to transition them as quickly as possible to private sector employment. So the budget will have to balloon and it will have to shrink. And of course the budget um, uh, will also depend on what's happening elsewhere in the economy. So these are a couple of moving targets and they're not always the most appropriate way to study costs of unemployment. But in the case of the Euro, uh, in the Euro we have artificial restrictions. We have some very concrete um, you know, uh, criteria like the Maastricht criteria that have to be met. So these are concerns as Dirk pointed out. And in that case, uh, I think that you could and people have done the work, you can still document the positive multipliers and the, um, the savings, the financial savings that uh, you will incur. But there will be always a, a dilemma, a policy dilemma, right? You might get very robust growth. And hypothetically, let's just say, you know, Germany is a net exporter, but hypothetically, you can imagine becoming a net importer, right? And so 
you then that runs against your master criteria. And so you, you will have competing goals. Do you actually provide for full employment or do you try to meet the mastery criteria? And it really will depend on the business cycle and on other economic uh, conditions. So I think, you know, from an MMT perspective, we try to, to um, elucidate the many uh, kind of uh, limits that have been imposed artificially on macroeconomic policy relative to uh, a nation that has its own currency. That's not to say that in the US, uh, we, you know, it, it is easier from a financial point, point of view, and it is easier to do national policy from a, from a, uh, from a, uh, from a budgetary stand, stance. Um, but I think what Dirk is saying is that we, we also are in need in Europe for a fiscal response to crises at the Euro-wide level. And the job guarantee is a really, uh, important structural tool uh, to do so. Thanks so much. Yeah, I agree. I just wanted to act as a devil's advocate there. Um, and I would uh, happily hand over to some of our guests who also have, uh, as I already read, um, very interesting questions. Uh, let's start with uh, Lasse Steffens, who is promoted and should be able to talk. Yes. You want me to um, answer, ask my question like this? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so my question uh, is about the work that David Graeber has done, an anthropologist. And he talked about that about a third of all people in the UK don't um, perceive their job as meaningful or um, useful to society. And my question is, would the um, job guarantee not only increase the chances of people being employed in jobs that they don't find fulfilling. Um, David Graeber, for example, um, proposed the 15 hour week or um, <clears throat> the implementation of a UBI. Thank you. Maybe let's collect three questions and then uh, have a round of answering. Uh, next up is Christian Zintel. Hi. Yeah, well, my question is uh, sort of in the same vein uh, that how do you make sure that people get jobs that um, fit into their abilities and their strength? Because, um, you know, when you have some experience with job counseling, you know, that's really, um, yeah, people don't understand, you know, your strength. And then they say, well, you know, we don't really have an opening. You know, the, the state probably can't build factories. For, for people who are factory workers and, and such things. So uh, how do you make sure that people don't get demotivating, mind-numbing jobs that, you know, really destroy their, um, yeah, their, their, their self-worth? Very interesting question. I would add maybe to that, how are we ensuring that the job guaranteed jobs are not competing with private sector jobs? Uh, and how should they be, uh, be designed? Uh, so maybe Dominic Meyer, and then uh, we have a round of answering. Uh, we cannot hear you yet if you're already speaking. I'm sorry. Uh, then maybe we start with answering and um, maybe Dominic Meyer gets his microphone going. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I think the first thing I want to point out is that job guarantee is a voluntary program. It's not a requirement for work. And so uh, one does not need to take uh, the job. Um, but of course, we want the program to be um, life affirming, to be designed well, and indeed fit uh, the jobs to the workers. So um, how do we deal with the <laughs> bullshitization of jobs? I mean, you know, nobody's proposing that the job guarantee should paint rocks, right? Or fill, you know, dig in holes. We're talking about remediation of the environment. It has always been green. We have many, many social needs that do not deliver commercial return and they are under provisioned. And so in that sense, we are actually putting value on something that has not been valued thus far and uh, trying to enhance the public uh, purpose that way. As I said at the beginning, um, the job guarantee is not a panacea to all policies. And because it's voluntary and because we understand that some people 
uh, cannot, should not work, their caregivers, their students, their uh, folks nearing retirement. It needs to be supplemented with various forms of uh, income assistance and um, <clears throat> different parts of the welfare uh, system. So it resides within a broader, a broader macroeconomic framework. Um, but it's providing one piece that's missing. There are plenty of people, many people who are knocking on doors, sending resumes. They just keep striking out and they want work, but they cannot uh, find it. I often talk about the job guarantees of participation income, that indeed it is, and, and the way it is designed, at least in my proposal, from the bottom up with the localities, local nonprofits, community groups that are there that propose the projects themselves, that um, increases participatory democracy, that strengthens the input of, um, of, uh, of people, the unemployed themselves, the community, in what kind of jobs will be created um, and matching the unemployed with those needs from that community. Um, again, we don't want mind numbing work. And I think that the design would help with, uh, uh, with um, addressing this, but once again, no one is forced or at least in, in the job guarantee proposal, we do not take away people's benefits uh, in order to work. Indeed, um, they have a choice um, and uh, job guarantee provides the choice that's missing. The question on how do we make sure it doesn't compete with private sector work is an, imp an important one. Um, one is by design that we do public service, uh, public service work. We're not producing cars. We're not producing cell phones. So we're not competing with the private sector. We're attempting to do what the private sector does not normally do. Europe has, um, what do we call them, public health deserts. In uh, America, we have food deserts, the absence of good, decent quality food in many communities. So, you know, community gardens will be appropriate here. Maybe health clinics, clinics would be appropriate there. Um, I think maybe the question that would be, and, I, I, and people ask it that we should address is how do we make sure that the job guarantee doesn't crowd out the public sector? Uh, because it is a, base, a basic job at a base wage. And, um, the way we propose uh, the job guarantee is that it is a policy for the residual, if you will, worker that is unable uh, to find employment. Um, in my vision of the job guarantee, the public sector is fortified and well staffed for ongoing and required uh, responsibilities uh, with all the skill level as required, depending on the kind of work. But the job guarantee is there that is needed to address this 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 problem of perennially throwing people out of work uh, uh, as soon as there is a, a downturn and helping those tr them transition back into better and more stable paid employment either in the public or private sector. So the so the answer to that question is it's a completely separate program from your large infrastructure program that the government will do from public health hospitals from inspection agencies. It's a separate program dealing with a separate problem. Yeah, maybe I can add to that uh, just a little bit of, of context. Um, so of course, we, we would suggest that there should be uh, a Green New Deal, for example. So if, if you do a Green New Deal, then the idea is not basically to have only people in these kind of job guaranteed jobs to, to do it, but it has to be an effort also sustained by the public sector working together with the private sector so that basically we are, we are innovative in the economy and we try to be as innovative as can be without being ideological. So we basically say, look, if the private sector can do it, let them do it. If the public sector can do it, let, let them do it. Okay, if, if the public sector is cheaper, then let them do this. Uh, if the private sector is cheaper, let, let them do that. If there's problem with monopoly in the private sector, let's make it a public thing. Uh, or a cooperative thing. So, so there's there's different policies for different questions. Um, and of course, one thing that the job guarantee will do, it will it will take away many of these crap jobs, because the people doing the crap jobs will basically say, look, if, before I earn I don't know seven euros an hour uh, driving around the town and delivering uh, packages uh, from Amazon, I, I prefer to have I don't know twelve euros or fifteen euros an hour to to do a job guarantee job. Um, even if that's not much better than the, the other job, uh, it only has to be better than, than this, this crap job. Um, so we have, of course, we have too many jobs in the, in the capitalist part of the economy, which shouldn't be there. In Germany, we have these jobs uh, where people uh, get extra money from the government because they, they get so, so little money earning, uh, uh, earning so little money on a full-time full job. 
Um, then the competition issue with the, with the private sector. Um, yeah, as, as Pervinia stressed, um, the, the private sector, um, they, they will do for profit stuff that is that is capitalist if you want, uh, but the job guarantee jobs are often also one time jobs or they are projects. So you're thinking about some kind of festival which you organize, maybe it takes a year to organize this. And then the private private sector can can bring in uh, some some parts as well. So I, I think it's it's rather crowding in that you have to think of rather than crowding out. So I think the private sector will thrive. Uh, they get better qualified people out of, of the ranks that are not having a private sector job. So they don't get unemployed people who haven't worked for three years or in, in Italy and Spain, 10 years. But instead, they, they get people who have shown up to work, who, who are dressing well, uh, who are employable. Uh, and and that, is, that is also part of the reason why this is a good, good idea. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yes, it sounds like... Uh, an interesting dynamic between crowding out public sector jobs, mm, being in competition with private sector jobs. Um, I would like to hear the next question from Katharina Bonenberger. If she is. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, my question is, so how can a job guarantee uh, contribute to um, a Green New Deal? And I'm interested, so how it contributes to growth independence. So. Does it help our economy to become less depending on economic growth? And I know that there's some research about it, but I would like to know what's your perspective on uh, that relationship. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, in the last chapter of my book, I discuss the three meanings of the job of the term job guarantee you will find in the Green New Deal resolution and in the policy proposals that um, were developed in the United States. So, um, you know, the Green New Deal is a is a is a bold industrial strategy. It's a vision for structural policies to move us uh, forward away from fossil fuels and to stabilize prices. Uh, stabilize um, emissions. But um, that green project, I think always missed, was missing a, a key piece. And it is the policy that will ensure the just transition. You know, the Paris Accord is quite clear that uh, any green strategy has to have a just transition for workers and some sort of security that resides in human rights. And the job guarantee is that. It provides that assurance that if somebody loses their employment in the fossil from the fossil fuel world, they will be guaranteed an employment opportunity, a stepping stone to transition into the future. So that is one meaning of the job guarantee in the Green New Deal. The second one is um, part of the industrial strategy. We will need any manner of work and skill uh, and technology and human uh, uh, effort to move us to the green transition. So the guarantee there is that um, whatever, um, whatever the investment is going to be will provide prevailing wages, will provide, um, you, you know, good union jobs, etc. And so here we're talking about wages and employment opportunities across the wage spectrum, where the job guarantee is the firm floor below which no one will ever fall. And then there's a third um, job, a third guarantee, not job, job guarantee, a third guarantee component in the Green New Deal that provides an income guarantee, early retirement for those who have worked in mining, for example, um, who have suffered the ill effects. And so it's a guarantee by the government that they will be taken care of with decent income and benefits. Um, it does have implications for growth, right? I mean, the first, um, the first observation is that growth doesn't deliver jobs, enough jobs, and it doesn't deliver enough good jobs, right? That's, we have seen this in the new liberal paradigm. So, so we are flipping the script and we are saying, no, we will guarantee at a minimum those jobs. And then we will do the public investment. You can call it the broader socialization of investment that would be necessary to achieve a green new deal. And, and uh, that will be the, the structural reform that will get us to a more sustainable future. I think that the question of, so we become less dependent on growth for the kinds of things we want, you know, good jobs. We actually create them directly, but we need to do some rethinking 
of the growth model because it is a um, parasitic model. It is environmentally destructive model. And um, uh, at least we will have employment security. But I want to say this because I didn't answer it in the, in the previous question that the job guarantee is absolutely um, consistent with a reduction in the working hour week. And I discussed this in my book. You know, we talk about 40 hour working week, but 100 years ago in the US, a 30 hour working week was the very popular option, narrowly defeated. We're way overdue to reduce working hours, in, in part the way Germany has attempted to do it and other nations, but um, these are no longer. Uh, becoming uh, enemies, right? They have become complementary policies, reducing working hours, um, as well as, um, um, yeah, there was one other one, but I forgot, I forgot which one it was. So um, yeah, more leisure technology, that was the other one, right? Technology is no longer the, the enemy of jobs. We actually use technology to improve quality of work, re, you know, re, more leisure and uh, um, uh, accomplishing, you know, goals like the green transition. If I just might add to this, there's, there's also this Green New Deal for Europe. I just sent the, the link to the uh, forum. Um, this Green New Deal for Europe, we I have, have co-written this with, with many other great people. Um, it's the European version, more or less, of, of the American proposal. We also, of course, basically say we have to reduce working hours, uh, especially because we need to reduce consumption. Okay, so, so of course, we need to, to reduce the amount of resources that we are using in the economy um, but that doesn't mean that we have to reduce the amount of money or something, okay? So we have to use money to move resources, and that is basically the, the divide. So modern monetary theory is about how this money thing works, but if you want to use money to move resources in a particular way so that we can all live on this planet for the next couple of centuries, hopefully, uh, then of course you need to, to basically connect these, these monetary issues with the resource issues. And of course, then you have to spend money in a way that is consistent with using less resources. And, and we, of course, we, we take care of this. And um, as Pavlina already mentioned, we are trying to, to get full employment, price stability, uh, sustainable resource use. Um, that's, that's the goal. It's not maximizing GDP or something. So GDP will adjust. It's just like with the New Deal in the 1930s. Um, people were desperate for work. They had hunger. Uh, they were hungry, going hungry. Um, you, you want to give them jobs and they, they need food. To, to eat, and then of course GDP will go up in, in some way. Um, but with the Green New Deal, we believe that probably GDP will go down in the first couple of years um, because we cannot substitute energy that that quickly. So, so I personally believe that that the energy uh, that we can use will, will go down because the stuff that we could burn, we we cannot afford to do that anymore for environmental reasons, not because of we don't have the money. Um, and that means there will be some kind of or maybe a U, U kind of shape. Um, and then, of course, when we replace these fossil fuels with, with sustainable energy and make sure that we don't use uh, fossil fuels to, to get those machines that we need for sustainable energy, then at some point we, we might have an economy where, where we can basically increase the amount of, of uh, stuff if you want. But I think that the resource use has to go down uh, for, for a long, long time. Uh, and that is very, very hard to sell politically. Um, but yeah, the discussion is, is ongoing, as you probably all know. Um, yeah, if, you, if I may enter here quickly, uh, Dick, you say it's about moving money. And there are some critiques who are asking, like, how quickly can you move this money? There is a common critique uh, of MMT and the job guarantee program that it's not accounting for the behavioral aspects of the economy and that its analysis of the inflation is insufficiently because when you implement the jo a job guarantee program you reach full employment they argue um, you have inflationary tendencies then these inflationary tendencies are as argued um, leading uh, to an inflation spiral just because of the expectations that are already formed and if you're already there at this point you cannot move back quickly enough to with raising taxes or cutting uh, cutting public spending uh, to decrease the infl uh, inflation again. Um, what would you uh, reply to that critique? Well, I mean, the, the government basically pays some kind of job guarantee wage. Uh, they don't have to increase it. Okay, that means that when 
if and when inflation starts to rise, which right now would be a good thing because we don't, I mean, we have deflation in Germany right now. Okay, so so again, inflation, to have a little bit of, of inflation is a good thing right now. Um, and again, if, if inflation starts to rise towards 2%, um, the, if you put the, the uh, job guarantee on a European level, then of course the Euro Treasury or the European Parliament might say, look, uh, because of macroeconomic reasons, we will basically not increase the, the wage of the job guarantee um, because we, we think that we have to deal with, with inflation. Um, and that would be something which probably is, is, is going to work. Um, it's the same with, with public sector workers. Okay, So in Germany, we just had a, a new round of, of wage increases for the public workers. Of course, these wage negotiations determine the increase in wages by the public workers, which has, of course, a big effect on, on the inflation rate. And of course, behavior is somewhere in there. Um, but I think what we can see from the Keynesian perspective is that the, the consumption out of income is pretty stable. Okay, So if people have more income, they consume more. So I think in terms of what is relevant for, for the macroeconomic part, at least, I think we, we have very stable macroeconomic uh, values there. Um, especially because in Germany we don't have we do not have that much private over indebtedness as we had, for example, uh, before the great financial uh, crisis in the United States, where basically people cut down their consumption because they they had to pay off debts. Um, so I think that we also in the 60s had a period of time where we had inflation rates of below two percent, and we had an unemployment rate which was hovering about one percent. Um, so it's possible to get these results where you have full employment and price stability. We, we have seen that empirically it, there, it's possible. Um, by the way, much lower in terms of unemployment than the US ever had in the post-war era. Um, so, so it is possible. Maybe Pavina can talk a little bit about the US experience. Okay, well, a couple of things. I think it has to be clear that the job guarantee doesn't promise to solve any and every source of inflation. Um, you know, they can very much be imported inflation, they can be cost push inflation, they can be an oil shock, they can be inflation coming in the United States from monopoly power and a healthcare industry, right? But the job guarantee is not promising to deal with those uh, problems and they need to be tackled by policy separately. What the job guarantee says is it doesn't introduce uh, 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 inflationary pressures and it stabilizes the um, inflation that emerges from the contribution of the government far better than otherwise. But there, there could be other expenditures in the public sector that are unsustainable. So the job guarantee stabilizes prices by stabilizing a core price in the economy, uh, the base wage, and by spending in an anti-cyclical way. So it, precisely when the economy is experiencing growth and inflationary pressures, that's when the government contribution shrinks. So it offsets them. Now, um, I don't buy the argument that once uh, expectations have been uh, instituted and formed, then uh, inflation, they will be accelerating inflation. Um, for that, you need to have, the expectations have to be validated by government spending. So if the government does not increase the expenditure, there shouldn't be at full employment, beyond full employment, then you shouldn't expect just expectations themselves are not going to drive right uh, overall uh, overall inflation. So um, so what what you want to see is you know in, in terms of the aggregate markup the other contributions uh, of prices paid by government will be uh, one way to look at you know where is the source of inflation where does it where is it coming from? Now I. Uh, I'm, you know, I am not one to argue that we have to use taxes to fine tune inflation. Okay, I know that you know there may be a little bit of a debate in the MMT literature, but I think you know for the most part the developers have agreed that um, you you can't really do fine, fine tuning, whether it's interest rates, whether it is at pump priming, aggregate demand management, whether it is taxes that you can kind of fine tune. Um, the economy for the purposes of full employment and price stability is not is not it. Um, you uh, spend to produce full employment. You control prices by spending at full employment and then look at the areas um, that might have uh, inflationary pressures. What you don't do is the current model, which uses quasi slump to check prices, right? We don't want to have unemployment and poverty be a check on inflation. So we wanna to move to a, a different kind of price stabilization regime. 
And the US, I mean, I mean uh, you were, you know, we did have experience with the price administration during World War II, right? So we we had full employment, you know, pretty much um, zero involuntary unemployment during World War II. Uh, we did have shortages in terms of food, so policies to ration some food or put investments in those areas uh, were ways to deal with inflation rather than laying people off. I should say that also at that time we had full employment and we doubled the minimum wage and that did not almost double the minimum wage very soon after World War II in, in the 49. And that did not produce this accelerating inflation that everyone is uh, afraid of. You know, it did produce a bump in living standards and um, the, you know, the floor of uh, base pay. Thank you for this comprehensive answer. I think Uts Gundert has a very uh, important uh, aspect of the job guarantee program, which takes it away from the maybe a bit US centric uh, discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pavlina. I, I mean, now, except for the for the US experience during the World War Two, is there any example for a job guarantee program in a country or maybe a smaller region? And um, what are the experiences in terms of uh, the, for example, the type of jobs created and in how far was it possible to reduce the jobs uh, after maybe economic recovery? The, the examples you gave, um, I, w when you gave them, I thought it would be a pity to give those jobs up again And or are there any plans in any region um, to or in any country to implement the job guarantee program? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, um, they have been outside of the United States, many experiments with large scale employment programs and smaller. Um, we have not had a permanent policy that guarantees employment to every single person anywhere. Um, the one that comes closest is in India, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which is a permanent policy and it provides guarantee of 100 days of rural employment um, to an unemployed person. And so it is legally codified, right? Uh, we can study it and we have some really good um, uh, evidence on especially the environmental effects of uh, of the program on poor rural communities. The one that I have studied closely um, has been the large scale employment program implemented in Argentina that was in fact modeled um, in part uh, after our proposal in the United States. Uh, it was called Plan Jefes. It was implemented in the depths of a crisis. It employed 13% of the labor force, very large, ballooned very quickly. And uh, we studied some of the features and some of the implementation. What we, what we found was that um, as the economy recovered, it very quickly shrunk. People were able to transition into um, uh, private sector employment, which is one of the features of this program. Um, so it was unexpectedly large because there was a lot of hidden unemployment, pent up demand for jobs. People flooded uh, the program, uh, especially women. And It had you know, very positive uh, gender effects as well. But as the economy recovered, it started shrinking and it shrank steadily. And we had job-led growth. In fact, unemployment started falling precipitously as GDP is recovering. Typically, it's the other way around. GDP recovers and then we wait and wait and wait for the job market to, to recover, right? It's a lagging indicator. So in this case, it wasn't. Um, because it was a crisis policy, it was uh, cut short. So we didn't, we don't have it in the next crisis to know. But it, you know, if 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 that's how it behaved in one crisis, you would expect it to behave, you know, countercyclically in another. There are policies um, such as the expanded public works uh, employment program in uh, South Africa that was very successful in poverty alleviation and creating some local resources. So those would be big projects that exist in the developing world. Uh, but there are small projects, you know, just across uh, the world that we can look to, mostly for the effects that it has on the unemployed people. Again, reducing social costs, providing, you know, public value, et cetera. Yeah. All right. As we are nearing the end of our session, I would like to uh, look ahead one week. Um, and we have the upcoming US election. We have huge unemployment numbers in the US. And with Bernie Sanders, we know uh, 
Democratic primary candidate who would have been in support of the job guarantee program. But Pavlina, I would like to ask you, what is your estimation when you're looking forward, how much would a potential President Joe Biden back this idea up? What is your estimation of the US labor market and mm, the consequences of the election on it? The consequences are enormous. We, um, we tend to be doing poorer job on stabilizing labor markets than, uh, than Europe, but Europe seems to tolerate very high and persistent unemployment rates over, over time. So while European employment, unemployment rates are lower, um, they are, I would say, uh, just as pernicious. So what um, in the United States we're faced with is, you know, a very, uh, very difficult um, period uh, and employment levels that we hadn't seen in uh, in a hundred years. Joe Biden has um, over time embraced bold, aggressive investment in green uh, in green technology and transitioning to a, you know a, a more sustainable green future. So the kind of infrastructure that he's promising, I think, will provide, um, if, if he's able to deliver, will provide many good paying jobs. Um, my concern is, again, with those who are forgotten, <laughs> the last people that are able to catch the job strain. And so if we are able to really push the economy into this kind of growth mo mode and put green jobs in place, Will that be a just transition? Who's going to get these jobs? If we don't provide the guarantee, are we going to still have the gender racial injustice that exists out there and people who are still unable to find basic decent employment opportunity? I mean, the job guarantee puts pressure on the private firms. You know, are we still going to have wage theft and, uh, you know, all the other, you know, problem practices in the private sector? It is not clear. We can certainly benefit from like another golden age with bold infrastructure investment, but But, uh, you know, I, I think that the, the left, perhaps, um, wing of the Democratic Party will be pushing more aggressively that that jobs uh, plan includes the guarantee that everybody can do it. So, you know, he has not himself endorsed the job guarantee. People in his circle have used the word job guarantee. But um, I think the pressure will come from outside of the center, like in the, from the periphery of the Democratic Party. If it is Trump, um, and we are faced with an enormous unemployment problem. I certainly have no faith that there will be a job guarantee, much less a socially just job guarantee. But I think that reluctantly, we will discover the direct job solution. If we are faced with double digit unemployment, that is an enormous social destabilizer. And we might be building walls and we might be having a very kind of authoritarian bleak future of job creation. That is not a job guarantee. Um, but I think that, you know, that's what the job unity is trying to do, to provide an aspirational alternative to, you know, more kind of right wing and authoritarian, you know, um, employment policies. That was a bit of a gloomy ending um, for, for our session today. I uh, once again want, uh, want to emphasize that Pavlina's book is uh, coming out in a German edition uh, soon. I don't exactly know the time timetable of that do you have more information on that in the next few months i don't i just got the news that it will be coming out in in hmm. german either way as we talk today in english for everyone who is uh, was able to listen today maybe the english version is doing uh, doing fine i uh, also uh, like to thank dirk Ains very very much uh, for his interesting contribution today and hand over to Thomas for uh, some closing uh, closing statements. Yeah, not, not so much to say to, to close. I'm um, really remarkable discussion and, and very good to have a lively discussion for next time because the only question I had in, at, at the end, but that's for next time then, would be um, on the regional note. Um, if you consider that a lot of job issues like in the Rust Belt and and other regions, comparable regions in, in Europe is, is a very regional phenomenon in unemployment, then my question, but that's for next time, would be how to handle uh, regional issues because you probably don't always need the same services just on, on this regional level. But that's um, just to close and uh, to thank you again uh, for having this uh, discussion and um, Anyone who wants to continue to ask questions, send us emails and we 
would like to establish a, a conversation. And just to say Tore is going to publish and to work on a paper on job guarantees for us also. So we will keep the discussion and uh, maybe invite you again to help us um, progress on that. And then let's cross fingers for next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And you know, Thor said that it was a gloomy note and I wanna end on a positive note that in fact, uh, the job guarantee has been polled in the United States recently in the UK and uh, other places and it polls incredibly uh, highly. Uh, people like it. And so I think that that is our maybe hopeful note that the conversation is changing around and maybe the politics are difficult, but uh, uh, the, it resonates with people and uh, perhaps it will um, kind of produce the same sentiment that brought us the new deal. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Dirk. you. And so bye bye.